Thomas CEO at Cloud Sigma. Uh, in case you haven't heard of us or come across us, we're a public infrastructure as a service provider. Um, actually, we're a Swiss company. Um, our main cloud is in Zurich. Um, down the road, we have two locations in Zurich, and uh, we also operate in the US, and we're expanding into South America and Asia later this year. So I wanted to take you through take you through um, some of the challenges that we have as a public um, cloud provider in a multi-tenant environment, in other words, um, with regards to networking and how software-defined networking, how we're using it today, and how we see the impact for customers and our business going forward. So really to define the problem up front, um, the main issue and challenge we have, or one of the main issues and challenges we have, is that as a public cloud provider, the nature of our network and the traffic flows that happen within our cloud are very, very different from the traditional enterprise environments for which the equipment and software was largely designed, if you go back a few years. So this is changing and this is where software-defined networking comes in. So what we have, what a traditional enterprise has is the luxury of essentially being able to design their system knowing this rack is going to have database servers in it doing Oracle or some XYZ database, um, this is going to have application servers etc etc so they're able to predict and build the traffic flows um, in a very kind of um, orderly fashion um, and then actually it means that the and also they don't scale out uh, as wide as, as we have to as a public cloud the difference for us as a public cloud provider is that you can imagine if we had 50 racks in a location and imagine each one of you is a virtual machine we can't tell which one of these virtual machines which one of you is going to talk to the other person so i can't tell any of your relationships which is also, by the way, the case in most cases, because I don't know you guys. So the reality is I have to build something where you can all talk to each other, but I don't know how loudly you're going to talk, how often, and the nature of what you're going to say. So that's actually the challenge that we have in our network. So it's, um, it's incredibly difficult because we're really um, unable to know that this virtual machine on rack server 12 in rack 1 wants to talk or will want to talk to a virtual machine on server 19 in rack 47 and it's in high availability active active mode and it needs low latency and it's going to need throughput of one gigabit. We don't know any of that stuff but we have to deliver that in a reliable fashion to customers. So that's kind of a big challenge and, um, and that's why th that's kind of one of the challenges of traditional networking for a public cloud. And then there are also technical limits that we start to hit when things like the number of uh, VLANs we can deploy in one network and we actually start to hit upper limits of sort of networking because again it wasn't designed for for this sort of uh, type of deployment. Okay, it has a small uh, field of thing. So these are some of the things I've been talking about. And essentially what we have is a very large, flat network where anything needs to talk to anything else uh, at any time and in volumes that were not predictable. So again, no, sorry. It's a slow push. Okay, I got it. Um, so the result of that is that we can get um, bottlenecks in our network. So we have hotspots, areas where our network can get overloaded, um, and this can move and change over time, and the result is a um, packet loss. So um, one of the ways of getting around that is by over-engineering your network to essentially be way too big for what it actually is required, which of course is wasteful and expensive. Um, or, or you just accept that you're going to have variable performance. That's kind of my visual illustration of variable performance. And so from a customer perspective, our challenge as a public cloud provider versus dedicated and private environments is to deliver that straight line reliable performance to a customer. And if you think about it, if we're able to do that, then the, chain, the differences between us as a public cloud and a private cloud deployment become much smaller because essentially when you buy a private cloud or a dedicated infrastructure, you are buying a sort of quantum of computing, which you understand based on the CPUs and the RAM and everything you've chosen. And imagine if you could do the same thing in a public cloud where you're actually buying not just quantity but quality so that you're able to have essentially a performance SLA. So the software-defined networking allows us to, or as I'll go through, allows us to start to move towards this performance SLA type environment where we can actually guarantee performance to the customer over time. So we want to go from, you saw the rapids, to something smoother and calmer that we can control and it's a more pleasant for customers. And it's about delivering straight line performance reliably over time. So 
This is typically how our infrastructure might look like as a snapshot. So basically we'll be expanding out the racks that go along the bottom. And to give you an idea, the latest deployments that we have, they're around half a terabyte of RAM per server. And we have about 20 in one rack. So that's 10 terabytes of RAM in every, um, in every rack. So you can imagine the amount of traffic, the 10 terabytes of RAM, and the thousands of virtual machines that that equates to, or can equate to, can actually generate in terms of traffic, or not, as the case may be. Um, and so you then scale that out over 20 racks, which is the kind of sort of pod size that we use, and you get the idea of the quantum of the kind of networking that we deal with and, and the problems that we have associated with that. And we, we want dense computing because we want to reduce the size of our footprint so that we can offer a, a better, a more performant environment. And so what we have at the moment is dual 10 gig networking throughout our racks down to the server node level and dual 40 gigabit ne networking into rack on top. And we actually use open source uh, routers or routers um, <laughs> using Viata, but you could be any, any router really. The main point to understand is that the amount of traffic we see going across the network is 10 to 20 times the amount of traffic we see going up and down. So you don't want an aggregation layer because then what would happen is you would have to send the traffic up and down, up and down all the time, which is, again, very expensive and it's inefficient from a networking perspective. So when you come to software-defined networking, what you're doing is making those switches on the racks, software-defined, enabled, like using OpenFlow or whatever you want, um, and then you usually have a, an SDA control that sits above it. Um, also, interestingly, you have the private connections and whatever solution we want, we want to be able to do seamless hybrid um, connections into our cloud, which is something that we offer already, so we want to be able to preserve that ability. Now, actually, we didn't um, use an open flow solution. Um, we used a proprietary solution, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit about that why. Um, so what we did is we, we chose an appliance which gives us a uh, no orchestration layer, essentially a flat orchestration layer with no single point of failure. So what we have is optical ring topology on the top of our racks, which is essentially that these machines here, they have the 10 gig networking internally, which will be 40 gigabits in the next version, which is in about three or four months. And then above that, between essentially between those racks, we now have an optical ring, which has terahertz of throughput. So essentially it's crazy. So what we've done is we've changed our cloud from um, essentially into one rack. So all of the traffic going from A to B is actually one jump, because it jumps onto the switch, and then it's optical networking to, the, to wherever it has to go. So it's, it's really great because we were able to take tens of racks or even hundreds of racks and essentially make them into one giant hole. So I like this picture. It's a bright enough your day. But it's also going to be used to sort of explain why we chose a proprietary versus a an open source solution. So what I wanted to say was that you know every technology you can think of as a wave and you're surfing that wave or we're surfing that wave. Sometimes it kind of feels a little bit dangerous like that as well. And so we have to choose where on that wave we want to be. And we look at each technology differently and independently. So for us, it's really not a sort of religious war about it must be open source or it must be um, commercial. Now we do support open source and we a member of Linux Foundation, and etc. So we, we believe in that. But on the other hand, we have to look dispassionately about what can offer us value. So you can imagine going towards the back of the wave, you have the standardization, the sort of general acceptance, and kind of standardized uh, sort of features and, and um, interfaces that you have with a more mature technology. And then as you go out, you get to sort of the fun end of the wave, where you have a lot of innovation, but also a lot of proprietary systems and commercial offerings. And so really, how we look at each technology, including SDN, is where do we want to be on this, on this curve? Now, if you're looking at fixed line telephony, you could say that this wave is probably not very big anymore because there isn't that much innovation. Maybe you have the color facts out here on the leading edge, but actually, in reality, there isn't that much innovation going on. Whereas in something like IaaS or SDN, there's a huge difference between what you can get at this end and what you can get at this end. And of course, the open source community is always chasing forward and incorporating a lot of innovation and standardizing it, which is great. But the question is where we want to be. So for SDN, we decided that actually it made sense for us to be much more closer to the proprietary um, individual 
and commercial end than at the open source end for now. And it's something that we review every three to six months. Um, and I'll explain a little bit why when you see the solution that we have. By the way, I don't sell the solution, so it's not a, it's not a sales pitch for it. I'm just giving you the, the logic of why and how we look at these different technologies. And to look at, for example, the hypervisor, which is critical for us, it's the other end. So we use Linux KVM, which is basically a totally open source and well-supported hypervisor. Because in that case, we decided that it made a lot more sense to have a, a very well-recognized and stable solution. So what we did with SDN was we um, took the Plexi solution, which is an appliance, just making sure I'm okay on my timer, which is an appliance where we're basically um, able to get rid of the orchestration layer and have this optical networking, as I said, on the top of the rack. And what it's done is allowed us to um, flatten our network in the way that I wanted um, and outlined at the beginning, and it also allows us to scale out, I mean, essentially infinitely for the purposes that we have. I mean, even a, a very large cloud provider could deploy without scaling issues. So, oops, sorry, it's over there. Okay, so in terms of what the real value is for SDN, beyond just helping our, us out and helping deliver straight line performance for customers, it opens up new product areas as well. And this is an area we're still exploring, but essentially there are a lot of potential value-added services which SDN can enable in a sort of self-provisioned, on-the-fly way, which is a very cloudy way of doing things, which is exactly what we want. We don't want someone to pick up the phone or send an email or something like this. We want the customer to be able to click or make an API call and pull down a load balancing service or whatever it is. So SDN allows us to do this. So through different methods of interrupting traffic and things like this, we can essentially propagate out new settings onto all our switches on the cloud um, that allow the customer to essentially have this value-added service. And you're talking about things like firewalls and load balancing, things like that. The other thing is we can, apart from coping with traffic, we can actually optimize traffic. And we can do a lot of, this is kind of like uh, net neutrality, so it can sound a little bit like people don't like it, but I think there are also non-controversial quality of service aspects we can do within our cloud. So we wouldn't generally say, you're a VoIP customer, you're more important than this database. That's not, not our job as a kind of a carrier as a, in a cloud. But what we can do is we can say this type of traffic, like SSD traffic, for example, because we only use SSDs in our cloud. So we can say, well, this is incredibly latency sensitive. This is not controversial. Everyone has storage, and they want their storage to go quickly. So we can, with SDN, we can actually allow the switches to understand what types of traffic are going through our cloud and basically optimize them to minimize latency on SSD storage, for example. Um, storage uh, traffic that's going outside of our cloud as soon as it goes outside of our cloud, it's into multi-milliseconds anyway. So whatever we do in the cloud, it's not really going to make that much difference. So there are certain things that we can do which essentially are net gains for all customers within the public cloud. And then the, the third area, which is really interesting, is being able to go into this um, area that I was talking about before, which is where we can actually define performance and services for customers on a customer basis. So you as a customer could come in and say, well, I need guaranteed X gigabits of connectivity between these two virtual machines with a maximum latency of Y. And we can actually deliver that today with the Plexi solution that we have and potentially other STN solutions. So that's really, really exciting because it means that customers can essentially, with a graphic equalizer almost, dial in how they want their performance, how do they want their network to perform, you know, what's critical and worth paying a premium for, what's not really critical from a networking perspective. So this is really uh, taking infrastructure as a service, meaning the as a service bit, to the next level. And I see this as a next development, and that's why SDN is very important. Because the networking drives everything from storage, you know, to basically everything that sits, 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 goes through our cloud is going over the network. So we need the network to work. So SDN is really the foundation that makes everything else work. And so finally, and I've been quick, so if there's any questions, we've got time. Um, the other thing is what we look at it is client-defined networking, customer-defined networking. So the idea is that the customer is defining their network. So they are able to specify their requirements in an automated self-service way in a public cloud. So these are the sort of things that you can do. Obviously, you can pull down different services. You can guarantee performance. Um, and essentially, this is driven through um, affinity networking. So in the solution that we've chosen, the way it works is we can actually create client meta networks that sit within our cloud. So you as a customer, company X, 
and you sign up for an account and basically you create all, you're creating all your cloud infrastructure and what we do is we tell our switches actually that this, these different elements are actually related and we create an affinity network within the cloud with various quality of service aspects. So we can actually say that this virtual machine over here and that virtual machine over there are actually part of some sort of coherent whole, meaning they're but from the same company account. Um, and so we're able to essentially make intelligent networking. So we can actually make the switches essentially client to us. We, they don't think like that, of course, the switch, but that's what we, how we're leveraging it. We're allowing, um, the, we're able in our cloud to make the networking customer aware. So essentially we can um, provide the right solution for every customer within our cloud um, with minimum performance and everything else. And that's driven from these affinity networks, which is a really, really interesting technology. And that was it. That was my whirlwind tour of SDN in public cloud. So um, if anyone has any questions or thoughts. Thank you, it was uh, very interesting. Um, what I'd like to hear is um, if you have uh, like uh, hundreds and thousands of customers on the infrastructure, there are uh, a lot uh, of, of uh, QoS rules um, your infrastructure has to be aware of. And my question is, um, how do you first um, translate it from your um, uh, self-service portal to actually uh, um, like input for, for your network that can be uh, uh, read and, and uh, uh, executed. And second, is there, uh, I mean, if, if, if there are all customers want to have uh, like the best service, what is what system is behind it? To, does the prioritization, is there kind of a rule engine behind it or how do you do that? Okay, so um, in terms of the interface, it's an API. So actually all the solutions we're using generally in our cloud are API driven, both internally and externally. So we will take the customer request and then we'll send it via API to the, to the, to the Plexi system in this case, and then that implements it across all the switches and that propagates out. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's how that's working via API. And we're very careful, we want everything to be modular so we can actually swap things out as well. So if we found a different solution, we could potentially drop that in. We just need to change the API interface and then you know it will continue for the customer. So that that's kind of how we're working on. It's got usually very modular. Well, it's always very modular. Um, and then in terms of how it works, um, essentially, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's two things. Firstly, the customer is paying for the guarantee, or would pay for the guarantee. So if they said, "I want a guarantee of 10 gigabits," then they would pay for that. And if we had more customers, we're able to see what's being guaranteed. So we can see if we're guaranteeing too much and we had to actually um, put more infrastructure in. But the point is, if we got to that situation, we're actually getting paid, so it makes sense. So we say, okay, well, the customers actually want all this networking, so we need even more networking, so we upgrade it. So um, that's, the, that's the idea. But in general, to get into contention, it's, um, it's quite difficult with the, with the solution that we have because actually the capacities are so high in, uh, across the racks because it's optical. So it's, it's just, we can't max out the inter-rack stuff, it's incredibly difficult. Um, it would be more about sort of um, jumps and things like that um, and being able to do the sort of um, the guaranteed throughputs but on the actual rack level. But in general what we try and do is we try and put enough networking on every node that basically um, means that the <coughs> CPU and RAM can't max it out. So. At the moment, we get on the edge now with the half a terabyte machines because 20 gigabits can be maxed out. So that's more of a resource allocation problem for us. So to answer your question, what we do is, and we haven't had to face this yet, but if we had to face it, what we do is we'd make it a resource allocation problem because actually using, this is part of what we're doing about um, performance, is introducing background live migration, which KVM is getting pretty good at. So the idea is that that allows us to deliver um, performance. So you can imagine, it turns our load balancer from, uh, sorry, it turns our orchestration layer from a, just a dumb sort of fire and forget, like you go here, you go here, to a more reactive, iterative, load balance type system, where it's looking at the load and networking traffic and everything else 
on the different nodes and it's monitoring that and if they go outside of normal range and we're not able to keep the SLA for the customer, then it's able to live migrate around. So if this has got too much networking traffic, live migrate over here. So from the customer's perspective, they don't see any change, but we're able to keep delivering over time. So um, it's, it's not just the networking, it's actually different elements we're putting together to get this sort of performance SLA. And SDN is one, um, live migration is another, and the other one is the SSD storage, where we can actually um, guarantee IOPS per drive and things like that. So you bring the three together and you can actually give a performance SLA that's pretty meaningful. I'm not really qualified to do it because I didn't do the full evaluation to be fair. Um, we don't use OpenStack as in the cloud anyway, so it wouldn't be favorable or unfavorable for us if it was in OpenStack. That's kind of not relevant for us. It would be more about the feature set. Um, and I, I mean, we, we tested OpenFlow, and so we were using OpenFlow switches. In general, if we did the open source one, we'd, we'd, in, we'd implement it ourselves. We probably wouldn't use a kind of a higher level orchestration because we're controlling what's going on on all the hosts anyway, and the switches now. So it was a question of whether we sort of get something sort of maybe more exotic that we just drop in that's sort of got all this magic that we wouldn't want to develop ourselves, or whether we do an open source one where we probably get our hands dirty, we would, in which case we would want to go in and plug in at quite a low level to actually drive the open flow directly. So we were kind of looking at more like, do we just basically do open flow and then drive that and pull it into our orchestration layer as part of what we do, or do we have this sort of black box, sort of shiny, thing that, you know, offers you something different. And that, that was kind of the choice. Um, and our networking guys decided that they wanted to do, well, I mean, it's a joint decision, but essentially their recommendation was to, to go for the appliance. And like I said, that might change in the future. So in the future, this has it's got links in now to OpenFlow, and that will continue as OpenFlow becomes more sophisticated. And so the idea is we can drop in non-proprietary solutions if we wanted to sort of essentially deprecate and go on to a new system. But we work on two-year hardware cycles. Everything in our cloud gets replaced every two years. So we're never really that committed for very long, So because after two years it gets replaced. So we can sort of roll out into other technologies as well. That's part of the benefit of using a public cloud. You know, we, we're some sort of outsourced R&D for hardware and things like that for, for uh, customers. So we do that hard work and we keep on the curve and you can just basically benefit from performance.